AWS had a massive outage recently. In fact, it lasted over 15 hours. Many of us were impacted because of this issue, either because we are directly using AWS or we were using application that was hosted in AWS. So in this video, we are going to spend some time looking at that particular incident and uh, what triggered it and the progression of events. And then uh, we will also discuss disaster recovery strategies, specifically in the context of an event like this. My name is Chandra Lingam. I'm a security and ML engineer. I'm very happy that you're able to join me today. So let's get started. Now, on the night of October 19th, uh, midnight, and uh, or 20th early morning, AWS started investigating reports of uh, multiple errors uh, impacting many of their services, as well as increased latency. Now, whenever AWS has issues like this, and this this was this was observed in the North Virginia region, also called as US East One. Now, whenever uh, AWS has problem with their services, they'll start communicating to the customers using their service health uh, dashboard. So, we're going to discuss uh, the progression of those events. What AWS also observed was that customers were not able to create uh, support tickets through their support center. So. The underlying issue was also impacting customers' ability to reach out to AWS. Approximately two hours later, they started identifying the root cause. Specifically, they noticed that a lot of requests to DynamoDB service, the NoSQL service, uh, a very popular NoSQL service in AWS, uh, the requests are failing in North Virginia region, US East one. Now, usually AWS communicates in the service health dashboard every 30 minutes or 45 minutes at a regular cadence. And the next update came after around half an hour. What they found was very interesting. Uh, they found that the underlying problem was with uh, DNS resolution. Not the DynamoDB service itself. The service appears to be working okay, but uh, DNS resolution was failing. In the internet, DNS is a very critical component. DNS is like a telephone directory. So if you want to call somebody, use the telephone directory to find the number and then call the person. Now, what will happen if that uh, number is invalid or missing or some wrong information is there? Now, a similar thing happened in the DynamoDB situation. The service itself appears to be working fine, but then all the uh, their directory, the DNS entry that points to DynamoDB appears to have been corrupted. But uh, when there are some DNS problems like this, most likely it will point to a human error or there could have been some security incident. Some malicious actor came in and updated it. But uh, if I were to bet, I would bet on human error. Now, many other AWS services also depend on DynamoDB. So usually AWS services depend on other AWS services for specific aspects. Now, when they were trying to reach uh, DynamoDB, they got incorrect information from DNS and uh, they were not able to reach DynamoDB. The errors are reported by the caller. And in this case, the AWS services, other AWS services are making a call to DynamoDB and they were all failing. So the AWS services that were directly interacting with DynamoDB were impacted. There were many other services that were indirectly dependent on DynamoDB because they were talking to another service that in, the, in turn talk to DynamoDB and because of that we had uh, cascading failures. In fact, uh, if you look at the AWS uh, event history, there were 140 services that were impacted because of this issue. Now most of these services are regional and that means the impact was localized to North Virginia. However, North Virginia is a very special region because it also hosts a lot of global services. So for instance, the billing dashboard that you see, the usage information from all the regions are consolidated in North Virginia, and then they will estimate the pricing for your usage. So that service is hosted in North Virginia. So that was also impacted. But in this scenario, that is not the most critical service. If you don't have access to billing, nothing is going to happen. But there are other critical services like identity and access management, uh, security token service, and so forth. Uh, uh, if you look at identity and access management, that's where you maintain your 
users, security policies, access permissions, all those things. Uh, that service is central in nature. So because you create all your policies in one place and use it across other regions. Now, if that get disrupted, it, the impact is no longer contained to North Virginia. Your applications and uh, services that are running in other regions will also be impacted. This is something to keep in mind uh, when uh, we look at uh, North Virginia region because it is a special region. So within three hours, they resolve the underlying problem. The DNS issues were corrected. But then because of the scale of impact, the recovery process is easier said than done. And this is where it became very tricky. This also gives us some rare insight into how AWS operates internally and how their engineers work and how they resolve the problems. And they indeed uh, saw some initial signs of recovery. But then uh, there were like 140 different services uh, that were impacted because of this issue. And how they all recover is something that we were able to observe through the event history. Now, one of the services that got impacted was EC2 service. Apparently, when you launch an EC2 instance, as part of the launch sequence, there is a dependency on DynamoDB. For the past three hours, none of these three, four hours, none of the EC2 instances were getting launched. It's not just EC2 instances that you spin up. There are many other services that use EC2 instances. So, so for example, RDS, Relational Database Service, uses EC2. ECS, EKS, Kubernetes clusters use EC2. And uh, Lambda, even though it's serverless, behind the scenes, it is uh, running on a heavily abstracted uh, EC2 instances. So there are a lot of uh, pending messages that needs to be processed in SKS queue. Lambda invocations are pending to be executed. So many requests to launch EC2 instances were piling up. Now we are talking AWS specific services. On top of this, applications that we host, they also have health checks in conjunction with uh, auto scaling and load balancers. They will detect failed instances and they will ask, they will initiate automatic replacement process. That's one of the benefits of cloud, right? So usually on the cloud, uh, your health check should not go too deep. The reason is if your if your health check is going and checking if your downstream connectivity is existing or not and so forth. So in this scenario, let's say you you have an EC2 instance that is talking to DynamoDB. If you if your health check is also checking the connectivity to DynamoDB. Because DynamoDB connectivity fail, it may incorrectly assume that uh, your EC2 instance is having a problem and attempt to replace a perfectly healthy EC2 instance. So this can compound issues. So now your EC2 instance is gone and then the replacement instance is not coming online. So there are multitude of problems like this that were piling up within AWS services themselves and because of customer initiated requests. After an outage or a downtime, when the services recover, the services, underlying services need some time to handle and uh, scale up, stabilize, and then start handling requests. So to give some time, the, the caller will do a retry. The retry would also do an exponential back off. So if, if multiple calls are failing in rapid succession, instead of sending more and more requests, you just pause for some period of time and then make a request and then pass a little longer, and so forth. So you increase the pass time more and more until the service recovers, and then you reduce the pass time. Now, another interesting aspect to consider is that there could be some kind of uh, complex cyclic dependencies. So EC2 it was not able to launch because DynamoDB was not reachable. And then uh, DynamoDB in turn is serverless, but behind the scenes, it also uses servers most likely EC2 instances. If DynamoDB needs more EC2 instance to scale up, it cannot do so because it doesn't have access to EC2s because EC2 service is failing. So this kind of complex cycle can complicate uh, recovery process. The AWS engineers handled this issue was by throttling requests. They started throttling requests, including Lambda invocations, SQS message queue handling, and uh, easy to launch requests and so forth, so that they allowed only few requests to go at a time, so that services can recover gradually. So this was going on, and then they observed another series of failures. 
this time related to network load balancer health checks. As we mentioned, health checks are a very critical component to detect and uh, respond automatically to failures and uh, replace unhealthy instances. Now, health check also needs compute resources to run. So most likely that got impacted as well. So that was also failing and the AWS team had to respond back to that. So overall, it took 15 hours for AWS to fully recover from this incident, all because of a single root cause, DNS misconfiguration. Now, let's talk about disaster recovery and how you can handle incidents like this. When I spoke with many of my friends, they were also frustrated because even though they had a multi-region DI strategy, for example, if service is not available in North Virginia, you can have a failover region like uh, Ohio or Oregon and so forth. But that strategy did not work. In this scenario, because of the scale of impact, including impact to services like IAM, STS, and so forth, they were not even able to bring up uh, their resources on the, uh, the uh, failover regions. So at this point, uh, this uh, North Virginia region became a single point of failure, and they were not able to deploy their DR strategy effectively. So the question now is, what do we do? It would uh, a multi-cloud uh, strategy help in this scenario? Instead of keeping everything in one basket, one cloud provider, should we diversify to multi-cloud? Let's assume for a second that this particular incident did not happen in North Virginia. It happened in Ohio or Oregon region, some other region. In that case, the your DI strategy would have worked fine. Because let's say your, your home region is Oregon and your disaster region is uh, Ohio. Oregon was impacted, you would have successfully failed over to Ohio region. It's just that North Virginia is a special region with a lot of global service uh, dependency that, that that particular strategy did not work in this scenario. So let's assume for a second that you have a multi-cloud strategy and your disaster uh, or failover region is in a different cloud provider altogether. So you're using Google Cloud or Azure, for, for example. Even if you fail over to that side, to a completely different uh, cloud provider, you may be able to bring up your application, but your application is going to have some uh, third-party dependencies, your software supply chain. Now, those uh, SaaS providers may have a direct uh, link to North Virginia region. So even if you manage to bring your application, it may not be fully functional because of these cross dependencies and complex supply chain involved. So that's something to be aware of. So in my humble opinion, what we need to handle first is have a disaster recovery plan at your individual company level and make sure your data is safeguarded. You're backing up your data because most critical aspect in this case is your data. You can spin up your servers and other things but if you don't have your data backed up, your databases backed up, then it can be a very difficult problem to address. Make sure you have your data backed up in one region and maintain a cross-region copy in a second region and possibly maintain an offsite backup with a different cloud provider. So that way your data is safe and uh, even if you have to implement a complex DR strategy, if, if this outage lasted multiple days or multiple weeks, for example, what would you do? In that case, you have to you may have to execute an alternate strategy of uh, bringing up all your infrastructure in a different cloud provider. That's when all these backups are going to help you. So at the, at the minimum, if you follow these things, your data is safe and you have the ability to independently bring these infrastructure up. I hope you found the information useful. If you would like to understand DR principles and how to apply them in the context of AWS. Do check out my course available on Udemy. I will be very happy to see you there. Thank you.